Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Wasserman. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here at UC Berkeley. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. I think it's a pleasure. Uh, let me, a few, uh, given the subject matter, it may not be the cause for merriment that we might like. Uh, a couple of program notes. Uh, first, a shout out to the Stephen M. Silberstein Foundation. Uh, Steve, so it's funded this, uh, this session. Uh, Steve Silberstein seems to have his name on just about every worthwhile endeavor in the Bay Area, as I've noticed in the two and a half years I've been here. And this is one of them, so a round of applause for Steve. He's <laughs> uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Deirdre English. Uh, Deirdre is a uh, former editor of Mother Jones. Uh, this session was her brainchild. Uh, she also now runs uh, the uh, Felker Magazine Center at the University of California Berkeley School of Journalism. And this session was her idea. So Deirdre, thank you for this. Um, I think the idea was to concentrate in a single session uh, torture, destruction of civil liberties, <laughs> massacre, uh, the general corruption of the young, and uh, have it all in one place, a kind of a cathartic purge, so they can go forward from here and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> and we have uh, some of the really uh, uh, formidable experts in those areas here, uh, and I'm kind of in awe of the talent that you have assembled here um, on, the, uh, on the dais. Uh, let me start with Karen Padgett. Uh, forgive me, because I haven't committed her, her um, biography to, to uh, memory, but... Uh, her, new, her latest book, I'm going to do a little flogging of books here. Her latest book, Patriotic Betrayal, looks at the history of the CIA's campaign to enroll American students in the crusade against communism. This was another NSA. Uh, this was the National Student Association. Some of you will remember that. <laughs> which was being kind of periodically corrupted. Uh, Karen has, uh, has been doing these kinds, this kind of work for about 45 years. Uh, and um, has written on topics ranging from gender politics to the U.S. military budget. She's also the co-author of Running as a Woman, Gender and Power in American Politics. Um, next to Karen is Robert Shear. Um, his latest book is They Know Everything About You. <laughs> uh, they, know, and so, uh, they Know Everything About You, How Data Collecting Corporations and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy, uh, Robert Shear is really a made man in the world of progressive uh, journalism. He uh, started with Ramparts Magazine and he filled a number of functions there for a number of years. <laughs> no Ramparts. And then uh, worked for the uh, LA Times uh, as a correspondent, foreign correspondent, etc., for what, 17 years, and then a columnist for the LA Times. Um, and he's a clinical professor of communication at the University of Southern California. Um, you can read more about his biography. He is, uh, uh, he, he, he's the man. Uh, next to him is Mark Danner. Mark Danner, there are several sessions at this book festival in which Mark Danner is not taking part. <laughs> but his range of erudition and writing accomplishments is truly impressive. Uh, he is now emerging as, in my view, the premier chronicler of the Bush Cheney Rumsfeld uh, debacle. Uh, through his work for the uh, New York Review of Books. Um, and this is his work on politics, violence, and war. Uh, it's uh, not a comedy, stripping bare of the body. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him. Uh, Marx divides his time between UC Berkeley and Bard College here at Berkeley. He is a, has a joint professorship at the uh, School of Journalism and the English Department. And I'm going to take the liberty of flogging another book, uh, not on your program, After Snowden, which just came out. It has a tremendous uh, has a variety of very uh, top uh, contributors looking at the impact on uh, public policy, impact on the press of the Snowden revelations. Hotting Carter has written it, David Colberry, Siegel, John Mills, Thomas Blanton, and moi. Uh, and so I do, I commend it to your attention. Um, our format here, we only have 50 minutes, so I'm going to be quiet uh, momentarily. And, and uh, I'm going to ask our panelists to speak briefly with opening statements. Uh, we obviously, the, the, the challenge here, I think, is that there's so much, there's so broad agreement among our panelists on the fundamentals of the national security state, and in fact, it should be deployed. 
and the like, uh, that finding the areas where really interesting and fruitful disagreement arise are going to be a little bit of a challenge. I'm going to goad them a little bit on that score. I think going forward, it'll be very interesting to look at what how the national security state, whether it's been problematized in politics, whether people will vote on the basis of the INA, uh, where we're heading with this, uh, and where uh, whether or not there's any possibility of this war on terror relaxing to the point where we get some reprieve from uh, the conditions that have arisen under, surprisingly to many of us under the Obama administration. So let me ask for opening statements, starting with you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, can you hear? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, since I'm accompanied on this panel by two wonderful, literally, tribunes of the future, and I have spent the last 15, 16 years looking backwards, uh, I thought, how can I uh, describe a little bit about what my book is about, but then how can I make uh, the bridge to our topics at hand? And it occurred to me that, um, and I had a great fun doing it, looking at the 20-year history from 1947 to 1967 that I was working on through the lens of media and the secret state, and particularly the secret state's reaction to the media uh, and it is particularly salient in that sense that um, the CIA relationship with the National Student Association uh, would not have been exposed, I think, at all, in but for Ramparts and Bob Shear. So my line is, no Bob Shear, no patriotic betrayal. <laughs> and I want to come back to uh, Ramparts. Uh, but first, let me just lay a little groundwork about patriotic betrayal. Uh, one, one of the things that I think held a secret covert operation in, in, uh, intact in a shroud for nearly 20 years were several things. Um, one thing is that in the, the United States is a bit different. We don't take students very seriously, or we didn't in the 40s and 50s. Whereas the rest of the world, they were toppling dictators and ousting colonial powers and at the very least dictating or influencing educational policy. Also, this was a liberal operation. These were liberal anti-communists both in the CIA and within the National Student Association. As, and as the uh, publisher of Ramparts once memorably said, what would the CIA want with a bunch of long-haired hippies? So that also was, they, I would think it's fair to say that the original Ramparts team found it all just very hard to believe and take seriously. But there are two other struts <laughs> to this. And I think um, the mo another very important one is that everybody who had an involvement and was made what they call witting in CIA terms had signed the security oath under the 1917 Espionage Act. And it is the same act under which Edward Snowden is being prosecuted. Now, the reason I'm going to tell you my relationship to the book and a little bit more about that security oath is that there are some wrinkles in it which become salient and make it a little bit different than what is going on today. Um, I was a very young wife and mother at age 20 when, having married the student body president um, from the University of Colorado, he was offered a job on the international side of the National Student Association. And um, but, uh, then we were both taken out separately uh, to essentially a safe house. And under, we both underwent the same ritual. In my case, they said to me, uh, NSA is very important to the United States government. And your husband is doing work of importance. We'd like to tell you more about that please sign this document because we need, you need to be, it needs to be in confidence. Importantly, they did not tell you what you were going to learn. You signed the document, you didn't really know it was called a security oath, you didn't know it was under the Espionage Act, you didn't know it carried a 20 year prison term. And um, I know some people will find it quaint, but as a young girl from Iowa, in 1965, I had absolutely no reason to distrust the government. <laughs> and so, and nor did my husband, who, uh, th uh, my then husband, who was from a small town in Colorado, so we signed. 
Then we were told that the CIA ran and funded the entire international side of the National Student Association. Well, it wasn't so burdensome for me because I wasn't working for the CIA or for NSA at that point, but he suddenly had a code name, a CIA case officer, reporting requirements, and mail drops. And our year was quite unique because 65-66, the president of NSA tried single-handedly uh, to oust the CIA. Uh, and the re I, that is also indicative of something else that happens in the mid-60s, and that is that people did begin to distrust the government because I think before then it's pretty fair to say that almost all of the witting participants were ardent anti-communists and um, felt that they were, as one put it, person put it to me, doing work of great importance. They felt as passionately about fighting communism as our generation did about ending segregation. Uh, so then there was, before Edward Snowden, there was a man called Michael Wood who um, was the development director of the National Student Association during this time, was not bound by the security oath, but finally um, learned about the role of the CIA in NSA from the president, uh, who was trying to oust them quietly. And they had a debate about uh, whether they could do it without going to the media. And um, it was a division of opinion at that time, and Michael Wood took the story to Ramparts. Well, in, even in the wake of Ramparts, uh, which was regarded by the agency as a catastrophe, um, there was no uh, congressional hearing. There was an uproar, but the damage control was so effective, and effective because even though there is some evidence today that these security oaths couldn't be enforced, because of the way that they were administered. In other words, they violated the CIA's own procedures because you, you didn't know what you were going to learn. So you signed it before you learned anything. Uh, so no one would, uh, beyond confirming the existence of a relationship, talk, which allowed the um, Johnson administration to basically come up with a cover story about what went on because nobody could really still understand what did they do and what did the agency get. And that cover story uh, included several elements that they, uh, the CIA gave them a few travel grants so that students could travel to international meetings. They never compromised its integrity and there was no espionage, all of which were demonstrably false. Well, if you, if you turn this 20 year period and think about media scrutiny and you think about leakers, um, here is what le leaps out at me. There was really no, uh, no scrutiny of the CIA for years. It was founded in 1947 after World War II. The first book, the first significant book, or maybe any book, was published in 1964. That means that when there was another, they call uh, catastrophes flaps at the agency, when the spy plane went down in 59, there was no congressional investigation. When we had another uh, eruption of the ill-fated CIA-led over attempted overthrow of the Castro regime, there was no congressional uh, investigation. Well, so this is a, a benchmark. Um, in 1964, the first book, now I think you could probably roll the books out to here, from here to Washington, D.C. But most people knew nothing about it. In fact, the leaker, turned to this book, Invisible Government, um, by David Weiss, to try to read up on what it was that was the CIA. Well, just two quick, other quick benchmarks, because the theme that I, uh, I think the theme that runs through everything today are the three themes of accountability, transparency, um, and um, oversight. They are uh, not, they are related, but not one and the same. So after this first book in 64, the, the New York Times decided to do an investigation of the CIA. One of its editors said, my God, I think they're putting us all in danger. So they devised a questionnaire and they sent it to all the Times bureau heads around the world. And um, here's the CIA reaction. Um, the head of counterintelligence, with the wonderful name of James Jesus Angleton, 
whose mission was to search for Soviet moles and who was quite paranoid by this time, called it, and I want to quote, the phrasing of the questions betrayed the hand of Soviet intelligence. Harrison Salisbury, one of the journalists on the project, described the CIA's reaction as a scream from outer space. <laughs> And when I say investigation, I use that term somewhat loosely because when John McCone, the CIA director, was interviewed, the reporter swam alongside him while doing laps in his pool. <laughs> well, then you get to Bob Shear and to Ramparts. And what was the CIA's reaction? And this is going to now sound you know, more familiar. Prior to the NSA story, they had published several exposés related to Vietnam. And the reaction of the CIA was to set up a top secret operation run by a man described by his colleagues within the CIA as um, a very bad man named Richard Ober. And he set up uh, an operation specifically to go after Ramparts and enlisted the IRS as one component of that attack. Um, I should say that Evan Thomas in his book, The Very Best Men, writes about an episode where one of the people who was tasked with destroying ramparts or at least suppressing these kinds of stories returned to his boss, Desmond Fitzgerald, in the agency, reported on what he had done uh, with ramparts, and got the following response. The man's name was um, Eddie. The response by Fitzgerald was, oh, Eddie, I believe you have a little blood on your pinafore. Um, and in the earlier discussions with Bob today, uh, he says that the IRS has never stopped. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just wrapping up my last sentence. I must be over. Sorry. Um, he says that they are still after him. And I was just going to close with the paradox that while there was almost no information during this time, I think now we are drowning in information. And yet the secret state still has no accountability, transparency, or oversight, and it continues to grow. Okay, I, I do want to uh, cut to the chase here because, hello? You can't hear me? Now you can, okay. God, this is, uh, I thought this was built by the most environmentally sensitive. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, listen, uh, we're not going to have any time here, so let me, let me be... Tough crowd. Let me be very quick here. I think the, the dangers that are invoked to justify uh, totalitarianism, suppression, and so forth, are never significant. There are dangers. There's lots of dangers. Uh, George Washington warned us in his fair, well-addressed to beware the impostures of pretended patriotism. Uh, the founders of this country faced many dangers in the world. They just fought the most powerful country in the world. Uh, they uh, feared others would come back. That one, they did come back in 1812, uh, did quite a bit of damage. They suspected there were others, the French, the Spanish, whoever, the Germans could come and attack them. Uh, and yet, the whole idea of our Constitution is that you have to assess these uh, alarms in an objective way, you have to have a public that's informed, and uh, freedom uh, is enshrined in our experiment in here, not because it's a luxury you can afford in the best of times when you have no danger, which is the way it's spoken of today, but rather in the worst of times to uh, correctly appraise those dangers, okay? And I remember when I was a graduate student here, the first uh, book that I got involved, I perished publishing, uh, and I wrote a book with Maurice Seitlin, who went on to be a professor at UCLA, uh, called Cuba and American Tragedy. And uh, it was a very intelligent, well-documented book, and it argued that this whole idea of a monolithic international communism was bullshit, uh, that uh, there weren't two communist governments in the world that could speak to each other civilly. Uh, Yugoslavia was really the model of, of disarray in that movement, and the whole idea of this being a simplistic internationalist conspiracy, very much like the current war on terror, which includes Sunnis and Shiites and everybody else, is nonsense. So you're invoking an enemy. Yes, we have enemies, we have problems, we have dangers, but the whole point is if you don't correctly appraise the enemy, if the public is lied to, if we're not informed, uh, then you cannot have a representative republic and you're led astray. 
and we've been warned about that by our best generals, Eisenhower and Washington and others. So what's really at issue is how does a republic uh, uh, continue and, and uh, can it continue as an empire? Can it continue when the public itself is lied to with impunity? And we've been lied to about every one of these issues, whether it's the Iraq war, it was the Gulf of Tonkin, it was the reason for going to war against Cuba, or what have you. Lying has been the norm. Classification is an excuse for lying. The government leaks classified data all the time in the pursuit of lying. Zero Dark Thirty was a movie made about justifying torture, and, and the, the darkest secret, who did actually went after bin Laden, was revealed to the writer of the movie. You know, and yet uh, <clears throat> uh, Kuryak, uh, one of the, the only person who had any knowledge of the torture who came public, just served almost three years in jail uh, for supposedly revealing the name of an agent, okay? So the punishment, going back to Daniel Ellsberg, one of the great heroes of modern American history, uh, is against people who, not for lying or uh, releasing classified information, they released it all the time, uh, that's the norm of, of informing people about national security, is when they tell us an uncomfortable truth. Daniel Ellsberg did that. He revealed uh, the existence of an academic study within the Pentagon called the Pentagon Papers that showed the whole war uh, in Vietnam was justified by a tissue of lies, and he faced 130 years in jail. You had to wait 40 years for Edward Snowden to come along and tell us the truth, okay? And the real question to raise about whistleblowers, and we could ask it about our own community of scholars and people in the media and so forth, if there were a million people who had the classification that Edward Snowden had, why is there only one Edward Snowden? That's the real question to ask about our modern society. How come so many people go along? And they go along with the lying. They go along with the torture. They don't tell us what's going on. And can you have a representative democracy when you don't have an informed public? OK. Fast forward, we get to the Fourth Amendment, along with our other amendments. And here was the government. The people who were going to be the government said you cannot have warrantless searches. It was slam dunk. The language is clear, all right? You cannot have general warrants. Chief Justice Roberts, who we love to vilify in these crowds, uh, nonetheless, in a very important decision last June, said you cannot dismiss the Fourth Amendment because of modern technology. You can't dismiss it because you have smartphones running around. No. In their unanimous decision, the court said there's more information on that smartphone than was ever in uh, anyone's house. It is protected. The police cannot crack through. They cannot uh, get through the encryption, and they cannot use that material. The Fourth Amendment is alive, it's well, and, and that's what's been violated, okay? And it, at the core of it is the notion of limited government. Does limited government make you stronger or does it make you weaker? Our Constitution is based on limited government and individual sovereignty, that we have fundamental rights that are inalienable, okay? Now, in the name of the war on terror, that got turned on its head. And we were told, no, we have a crisis, we have an argument, uh, we have a problem uh, that cannot be resolved except through uh, secrecy, totalitarian means, and what have you. And most people bought it. And they bought an argument that the founders of this country rejected, clearly. And they were at a moment of incredible danger. The people who signed off on the Fourth Amendment, after all, and Justice Roberts made the point that the principle of the Fourth Amendment, which goes back to the Magna Carta, which goes back to the whole idea of even a limited monarchy, that the humblest peasant in the land, that his effects or her effects and personal data had to be off limits to the agents of the king, agents of the king, right, without specific due process and warrants. That was the idea. And the people who enshrined that principle were going to be the government. And they said, basically, you have to check us, you have to keep us in check, you have to know what we're doing. That was the principle. And that somehow, after 9-11, that got tossed aside. No, we can't afford that anymore. We can't afford that. And that is really the issue. Now, let me just throw two quick points in. What was done, two quick ones. What was done under, well, I can wait until after, but let me, just quickly. What was done under Ram, against the, what Ramparts was dealing about was nothing compared to the current situation for two reasons. Uh, certainly technology. Certainly the amount of information is known. So, for instance, Martin Luther King, who the Hoover and the FBI targeted to destroy, the information they had on Martin Luther King, now they would know everything. They'd know how far he read in the book, who he talked to, who he had dinner with, and everything, and he would be gone. 
So you have the modern technology that makes a mockery of any of these previous restraints. You can uh, profile people. And I would point out, finally, I'll end on this, what the CIA then did going through cultural organizations is nothing. How many people here even know of InQtel? Please, hands. Oh, you wrote the book with me, Sarah. <laughs> now, that's amazing. It's my wife and the woman who worked on the book, Sarah Bellotti. And there isn't anyone else here, anyone else here who knows what InQtel is. InQtel is a corporation formed by the CIA even before 9-11 started flying, that has at least 250 startups, corporations in Silicon Valley that were funded in part by the CIA, cooperate. One of them is a company called Palantir. Palantir uh, was funded by the, but through InQtel with CIA money and PayPal money, brought in their only client for the first three years was the CIA. They were given total access to CIA data, and they are now the people who've designed the search uh, logarithms Bob, and so this is forth. Just opening statements. Yes. Okay. Search logarithms <laughs> for for the 17 intelligence agencies, the Los Angeles Police Department, the New Orleans Police Department, so forth. And you don't even know about it. Thank you. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. Um, it's, it's really an honor, uh, an honor to be here and a pleasure to be uh, at the first annual book, uh, Ber Bay, Bay Area Book Festival. I was going to say Berkeley Book Festival, which I, I hope it's the first of a hundred or a few hundred. I'm very excited about that. And I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, uh, and I love the fact that only in Berkeley, as I was just reflecting, do I find myself on the right wing of a, of a, <laughs> of a panel. It's, it's an unexpected position, and it, it, it feels bracing. I feel like I'm the, the Fox News element up here. Um, you know, I think the historical uh, background here is extremely important, and I listened to Karen's presentation and then Bob's with, uh, with enormous fascination. Um, uh, it is true that since the National Security Act of 1947, uh, uh, we have been living with a secret state. That is true. Um, it's also true, it seems to me, and it's important to point out, that the post-9-11 era, which is now in its uh, 14th year, uh, is different. Uh, there are things that are distinct. Um, it began with the largest uh, uh, and most lethal terrorist attack in the history of the world, which killed nearly 3,000 people. And in its scale uh, and its design and its drama uh, was different than anything that had come before. It was shocking and terrifying in a way uh, that nothing had been up until that moment. Uh, and I think because of that initial attack, we're led uh, partially to an answer to what I think is a critical question. We're in this state of exception, call it a state of emergency, martial law. We've had it a number of times in our history during World War II, World War I, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War. But this particular state of exception is not ending. It looks like uh, it's permanent. It feels like it's permanent. Um, it's certainly the longest we've ever had. I mean, the great writer on the, this issue, uh, Clinton Rossiter, called these states constitutional dictatorships. Uh, and he was writing after World War II. Uh, so we're in a state like that now in which civil liberties have been dramatically constricted, uh, in which the state has undertaken uh, as a matter of official policy, the torture of hundreds of detainees. And we see no, even though the government has changed hands, even though we went from uh, national security, Republican, strong leader, I am the decider, George Bush administration, to Barack Obama, first African-American president in history, liberal, and so on, in some way, we thought. <laughs> Even though we made that transition, when it comes to most of the secret state policies that it is our responsibility to discuss today, very little has changed. And I think that's, 
to me, the key issue. Why has very little changed? I covered the 2008 election. Uh, I was in Florida, in Jacksonville, when Obama, uh, on election day, when Obama won. And I remember the political uh, inspiration I felt. I thought, my God, for the first time in my life, I really believe in this guy. And I believe that these issues I've been covering, in particular torture, are going to be resolved. People will be prosecuted. Torture will, be, will end. People will be prosecuted. Uh, we will return in some way to a pre-9-11 state. And in fact, that has not happened. And I think that uh, now that I've asked the monumental question, what are the answers? I think one of them is the scale of the terrorist attack. The second is that we returned to a previous state that was very accustomed for the United States, which is to say the permanent war of the Cold War. That uh, remarkable Defense Science Board report in 2005, which examined the government's response to 9-11, essentially said that the US bureaucracies returned to their accustomed Cold War roles, only in much, much greater scale. The defense budget, already bigger than the next 10 nations in the world combined, doubled. The intelligence budget, broadly conceived, which was then, I think, about $40 billion, quintupled, quintupled, all because of this, uh, this one attack. So you had an enormous expansion of the national security state. And the second point I want to make is this was noticed. That is, we're here to talk about, among other things, the news media. This was covered. This was reported on. The press has many things to answer for, I think, but ignoring this phenomenon is not one of them. Uh, torture was first reported fairly extensively in 2004. It was noticed and reported on in a front page Washington Post story in 2002. Uh, and I wrote a book on it in 2004. Many other people have written books on it. The national surveillance state that we're talking about today and the surveillance that was covered, supposedly covered by Section 215 of the Patriot Act that was circumscribed in the vote by Congress earlier this week, that was first reported on in the New York Times at the end of 2005. So we've known about it for a decade. Um, and here I guess I would agree with Bob that one has to look not only at the press, but the citizens of the country and what the government has been able to do with the help of that most lucrative of political emotions, fear. Uh, both administrations, that of George W. Bush and that of Barack Obama, have used fear, I think, to great profit. And I think when we talk, I, we could have a lot to say about the Bush administration, but I think the more interesting one now is the Obama administration and why President Obama didn't do many of the things when it came to national security he pledged to do. He did do some other things. He withdrew from Iraq, uh, although we're back there again. Uh, he started withdrawing from Afghanistan. I mean, there, this is not an unblemished or, or a simple record. But when it comes to the national security issues that we're here to talk about, President Obama has been, I think to a large extent, a prisoner of the national security bureaucracies. Though he stopped torture, uh, he prosecuted no one. He stopped the process of disseminating information, disseminating photos. Um, he has essentially protected those who designed those programs, uh, one of whom now runs the CIA. Uh, so torture as a consequence, which was once an anathema, and yes, the United States was involved in it in various places over the years, and we can talk about that, but officially an anathema, torture is now a policy choice. That is, another administration, for example, a Romney administration, would have reinstituted it under the heading of enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, that was clear uh, by the time uh, the election came up. Uh, surveillance, so far as we know, in most areas, he's actually increased it. And this program, uh, the terrorist surveillance program, or Stellar Wind, as it was originally called when it was instituted, uh, four weeks after 9-11, three and a half weeks after 9-11, has finally now been slightly, slightly curtailed 
uh, by a decision of Congress that the administration at last went along with. The only thing that was curtailed was the bulk collection of telephonic met metadata, that is, details about your telephone calls domestically. But an enormous amount of our information uh, is still being collected, much of it through other programs that operate supposedly abroad but sweep up vast amounts of the information of Americans every day, including your email, Facebook, so all sorts of social media accounts. Uh, all those things are being swept up under other authorities, the FISA Act of, uh, Amendments Act of 2008 and Executive Order 12333, among others. Those things we've not even started to debate. And the question is, and I think I must, am I, yes, um, I will, uh, we, we need a discussion on this, so let me, let me get to, the, let me get to the, uh, uh, the last point. I think we should take some satisfaction in this week's vote of Congress in that it represented a uh, collaboration or a coalition, if you will, between uh, Democrats and civil liberties Republicans. Uh, and many of the 80 or so, or 77, I think, votes against it in the House, against the USA Freedom Act in the House, came from people who wanted it to be stronger. And we should take some satisfaction from that, because it may be that we will look back and say that this particular vote was the beginning of a tracing of the boundaries of the secret state. Not pushing them back, not reversing them, but a beginning of a tracing of the boundaries. And the question is, some other of these provisions, the ones I just referred to, <clears throat> also will be sunsetting, as uh, Section 215 of the Patriot Act was, uh, one in the FISA Act, not till 2017. And the question is whether we'll have another such debate about that, and whether we will have, whether that reaching of the boundaries will mean that the universe of the national security state will start to collapse and start to get smaller rather than larger. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm not telling you that that's my analysis, but I'm telling you that this is one opportunity for that to happen. And it is no accident, I think, when the first tracing of these boundaries has to do not with torture, not with the waterboarding of people on the other side of the world who are other than us, or people in Guantanamo who are other than us, Nobody seems, or very few people, seem to care much about that. The politics of that cuts distinctly in the other direction. More people are in favor of torture, so far as we know, at least most polls indicate, that, than were at the beginning of the Obama administration. So the politics of that are going in the opposite direction. But when you look at and collect Americans' telephonic data, some of them start to get concerned. Some of them start to get concerned. And it is possible that this will be the beginning, uh, the beginning of the partial, and I emphasize partial, rolling back of the secret state. The secret state is not going to go away any more than it did uh, after the Vietnam War or the Korean War or other periods of state of exception. Uh, but it is possible that its extent may finally be circumscribed to some extent, and we may get the kind of investigations and interest in investigations that we had uh, uh, with other of these scandals over the years. I, I hope that's the case. A question for the panel. <laughs> you're, Mark, you're awfully uh, kind to the press, and it is true there have been good disclosures about the extent uh, of uh, surveillance and the like, but one might argue that the game was given away on September 12, 2001, when the New York Times headlined its front page, U.S. Attacked. Mm -hmm. Once that definition of the U.S. being in a, in a battle for survival against an, an un, a, a vast realm of savage uh, uh, terrorists, once that definition was endorsed, and it was almost universally endorsed by the media, mm -hmm. uh, then it seems to me that the door was open for, any, any, uh, for as much abuse and as much strengthening and consolidation of the executive power as we've seen. So I, I wonder whether they gave away too much right then and there. Well, I think that... that may well be the case. I think I, I agree with you completely that the defining of this effort as a war, a war on terror, uh, and a war that supposedly is parallel to other great national struggles like World War II, uh, from that many other 
of the violations that we've talked about have, have flowed. And I think that's right. I also think you know the press has a lot to answer for. There's no question about it. We can talk about the run-up to the Iraq War. I mean, there are a lot of things we can discuss. We can talk about the fact that the Times held uh, James Risen's story on Stellar Wind for a year before they published it. I mean, the press has, I don't mean to be overly kind to the press. The press has made a lot of mistakes. And in the period during the run-up to the Iraq War has been a, was a disgrace, uh, with many exceptions, but in large part, uh, was a disgrace. But what I, I was trying uh, to say was that at the end of the day, it seems to me that uh, many of these, pro that the problem with these programs, the reason they're still in place, is not because we don't know about them. That's all. That indeed, they, they have been revealed, uh, and they've been revealed in a way that wouldn't happen uh, in a lot of other countries as well. Um, uh, the surveillance programs have been revealed. You know, I tip my hat to, to Edward Snowden and to Glenn Greenwald and Barton Gelman and others. Uh, those revelations will continue to come out. Um, but the political consequences of them, which, which I think is what's most important here, have been distinctly limited because the government has been expert at drumming up fear. The press, I agree, to some extent has cooperated with that. Uh, and. Uh, I don't think, at the end of the day, this is the major problem is the press. I wish it was the press. Yeah, let me take issue with what you said before. I think uh, it gives away the whole argument to say we were experienced an attack that no one in the world has ever experienced. It's utter nonsense. Uh, every single country in the world that has suppressed freedom, attacked its own people, instituted a totalitarian model, could draw on grievances, enemies, attacks that exceed what we experienced on 9-11. I'm sorry. They all do it. They can all talk about it. I don't care whether you know, it's the Armenians and, you know, and the Turks or anyone else. I've never been in any country in the world, and I've been in a lot of totalitarian places, where they couldn't summon the whole history of grievances. And, and uh, the idea, this 9-11 attack, which it was not an existential threat to the governance of the United States, just think, for instance, something we never mentioned, if what we mean by terrorism is tar deliberately targeting civilians. What the hell was Hiroshima and Nagasaki? What was it? I mean, how dare we talk about 9-11 as the most egregious, frightening attack when we targeted school children during the day and we've never really even examined it, or the carpet bombing of, of, of Tokyo. Uh, you can go down the list. You know, I, I wasn't, um, just to, forgive me for interrupting Bob Shear, which is a perilous thing to do, but, um, but there have been enormous atrocities. One could cite all kinds of things, terror bombing, et cetera, et cetera. I was trying to make a simple point, which is that the attack by civilian airliners that were hijacked by suicide bomb bombers, and which killed 3,000 people, was uniquely shocking as a single event. Okay. And, and that, I, I, you know, I, I, under, I think that's I, true. I, I understand that. I, I audience wait. wants to ask a question. I, no, I want to just pursue this for one right. second here. The fact of the matter is, and by the way, the two of us have been on lots of panels, and we both agree on this, by the way, that 9-11 and the horror of it was hijacked. We were on the other side sure. of the uh, Hitchens and native uh, debates. It had nothing to do with Iraq. It had nothing to do with a war against Sunnis. Completely it had nothing agree. to do with Muslim fanaticism. So we, we, we're not in disagreement. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm saying what you're, unfortunately, if you accept this argument that this was an attack unlike any others, you give these guys a pass. And, and the no, fact I don't is, think I, I don't think okay. I did give All them right. a pass. I'm sorry. All right. So, but I do want to. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I just want to be clear about this, that, that the fact is the reason the founders enshrined these freedoms of the press and speech and so forth is to be able to get clarity about what your enemy is up to. What are the dangers? And this whole hysteria, whether it was first the war against an undifferentiated communism or now an undifferentiated Muslim terrorism, is a way of intimidating people, destroying logic, destroying reason, making fact irrelevant, Okay, that is what we have been through. It's a process of manipulation. Folks, uh, I would have liked to have heard your questions. I'm afraid we've run out of time. <laughs> panel.
Thank you very much.